Time for some more October Patreon birthday shoutouts. I want to thank you all for supporting the show financially. It really does help me get everything done that I need to get done. And the greatest thing of all, being able to finally pay an editor so I can actually produce more content, which we'll be talking about later. Anyway, I do want to say a very, very happy birthday to Deb, Sage, Tara, Portia, Lil, Doug, Carrie, and Anna. Thank you so much for your support. Have a happy birthday. I hope you have a great celebration. Go out, eat some extra cake for me, and have a great month. So happy birthday. Fourteen-month-old Jaden Lesky disappeared in 1997 from his babysitter's home. The babysitter, his mother's boyfriend, said he left the little boy alone for around 40 minutes. While many didn't believe him, there was evidence of a break-in and other suspects to pursue. Would the police be able to narrow down the person responsible, and would a jury agree? I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. This is a part two, so go back and listen to part one before you check this one out. I know that they're not usually as long as the episodes I generally split up, but I have a voice situation going on. I actually think I sound a lot better today than I did yesterday with the last episode. So anyway, let's see if we can get through this one without my voice cracking too much. When we left off, Jaden Lusky, who was 14 months old, had gone missing while his mother Belinda's boyfriend, Greg Domasavich, was babysitting him. The police suspected Greg, but Belinda initially did not. She thought it was Greg's ex avon whose brother, Kenny, and friend Darren smashed the windows of Greg's house in the time frame Greg said Jaden went missing, and they seemed like pretty reasonable suspects. And it was confirmed, as in they confessed to it, that they broke the windows. And it was not Greg doing this to stage some kind of break-in. Kenny and Darren walked the police through everything they did that night. They said that they had staked out Greg's house until he left sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. They said Greg first walked out to his trash can and threw something away, before he went back inside. About two minutes later, Greg came out again and left in his car. A neighbor had also said she heard his car in this time period. They said it was after Greg left his house that they vandalized it and ran off. If they are to be believed, this puts Greg leaving the house an hour or two before he picked Belinda up. This was the time Greg told investigators he was home playing video games. But the real investigation into Yvonne, her brother Kenny, their friend Darren, really focused on what happened after they left Greg's house. If they went in there and took Jaden out, where did they go and did anyone see them with him? And after talking to multiple witnesses, there were no signs of Jaden with any of the three that night. And they did have witnesses who saw Kenny and Darren running from Greg's property and no one saw them carrying anything. Kenny and Darren then basically acted like drunken jerks, throwing small rocks at a group of teenagers just to intimidate them, as far as I can tell, and they did not have Jaden with them at that point. One police officer said that if they had just kidnapped a child, why would they try to make a spectacle of themselves in the area afterwards so that people would see them there and be able to identify them as being in the area. However, that logic doesn't track for me because if they took Jaden and hid him somewhere, why would they not make a spectacle of themselves? Then they had a bunch of eyewitnesses saying that they didn't have a baby with them. If people are intentionally crafting an alibi, they want to be seen. They want a receipt. They want a witness. They want something other than I was home alone. I'm not saying they were manufacturing an alibi at all. I'm just saying that here we are with yet another case and something one person finds as incriminating 
is something that can also be seen as exonerating and vice versa. Confirmation bias is what seems to determine the interpretation, not logic. In the end, regardless, Avon, Kenny, Darren were all ruled out as suspects, but if they weren't the kidnappers, they were at the very least witnesses. They said they did not see or hear Jaden in the house while they were there. Admittedly, they did not go inside. But they did say they saw Greg throw something in the trash can outside, which is the same place the police found tissues with Jaden's blood on them. There were other issues the police found with Greg's story, though, not just the timeline. Greg had Jaden from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m., yet, according to Greg, all he fed him were some chips. The little guy had only had toast for breakfast before that, and reports were that Jaden was a big eater. But even if he wasn't, he would need lunch and dinner, but all he had all day was some toast and some fries. And then we have those missing phone calls. Greg spoke to Belinda at four and said he was going to bathe Jaden and drop him off. No one heard from him again until 10 p.m. when he called a neighbor about the diapers. That is six hours where Greg claimed he was home, but he can't prove it, and there is some circumstantial evidence that he was not home. We also have the claim that Greg said he left at 2 a.m., but then we have Kenny and Darren putting that up to two hours earlier, as well as the ear witness, the neighbor who heard the car earlier. However, Yvonne did have a car that was also loud, so it was possible what the neighbor heard was actually her car pulling up as they waited on Greg to leave his house before they then vandalized it. Kenny and Darren also could have the time Greg left wrong. Those are possibilities. So maybe Greg didn't lie about that, but we know he lied to Belinda about Jaden being in the hospital, and he admitted that. And he didn't just do it when he picked Belinda up to cover for leaving Jaden home unattended. He did it at 11 p.m. when Belinda called him, which was hours earlier. The investigators, of course, checked, and Jaden was not seen by any hospital in the entire region that night. So why did Greg tell that story at 11 p.m., which was hours before he supposedly needed it to cover up for leaving Jaden alone? And then as for what Greg did after he dropped Belinda off at her house, we have another gap. He said he was looking for Jaden, but the time frames he gave would have taken up about half the time that he had free to do all that stuff. So his explanation did not convince the police. On July 16th, 1997, about a month after Jaden's disappearance, Greg Domasavich was arrested and charged with Jaden's murder. And I was surprised researching this that this is the point where they arrested him. To me, the evidence seemed a bit thin for a court of law. But they proceeded in building what looked to be a no-body murder case against Greg. However, six months after Jaden went missing, his body was found. It was New Year's Day, 1998, when a family was picnicking at Blue Rock Lake. They saw Jaden's body in the water. This is about a 15 to 20 minute drive from Moe, and the body was in the water near the dam. When a constable arrived at the scene around 6.05 p.m., he performed a task I am sure haunted him for a very long time, and he pulled the little body from the water. A forensic pathologist arrived at the scene and noted that there was an elastic bandage over Jaden's left arm, and it was wrapped in tape. It went from his elbow to his wrist, in some sort of makeshift cast or splint. Belinda was not aware of any arm injury, and Greg had not mentioned one. The autopsy would explain the bandaging. That arm was broken through the ulna and the radial bones. That's a pretty severe break. There was a slight sign that one of the breaks may have started healing, but it was inconclusive because it could have been a post 
post-mortem artifact, according to the medical examiner. The break itself would have been very painful, and since Jaden didn't have the arm wrapped before that day, I feel like circumstantially speaking, we can say the evidence points to the injury happening on the day of his death. Another injury that had actually definitely had signs of healing was a non-displaced rib fracture. Jaden would have suffered this injury a week, maybe two weeks, maybe even a little more before his death. So we have two instances with three broken bones in a two to four week span in a small child. He was not in a car accident and he did not have bone disease. So we can say these signs point towards child abuse. These breaks, however, were not the cause of death. It is believed the most significant injury, which was blunt force trauma to the head, was the cause of death. But due to the state of Jaden's remains, they could not say for sure, and the cause of death was listed as undetermined. A tox screen was run, and they found a drug called Benhexol, which was sold under the brand name Artane. It is primarily given to control the symptoms of Parkinson's, but back in the late 90s, it was also sometimes prescribed to help treat some of the symptoms of the antipsychotics on the market. It's not as common in that use now, since our antipsychotic medications have vastly improved when it comes to side effects like tremors and rigidity. Honestly, one of the greatest developments in mental health care has been antipsychotics without those debilitating side effects. Jaden would have no reason to have this medication in his system therapeutically, and no one in his life, including Greg, had a prescription for it. While it can be used recreationally, no arcane was found on any of the searches of Greg's property or Belinda's. It's impossible to say if Jaden was given the medication or if he ingested it accidentally. It is unlikely to have killed him, though that is a little iffy. Because of how long between when Jaden died and his body was found, the tox screen results can tell you something's there, but it doesn't really give a good idea of how much was there at the time of death. And if we don't know how much was there at the time of death, we also don't know what effects it could have had on Jaden. The day after Jaden's body was found, the water was searched using divers, and where Jaden was found was near the dam. So that's where they started and then spread out from there. On this search, a white plastic bag was found. Inside were some children's clothes, a baby bottle, a bib, an apple, and a pair of children's boots. When the items were shown to Belinda, she said some of the things were things she sent Jaden with that day, but she said some of those items may have actually left the house after Jaden went missing. And this is a really odd part of the story that I really personally can't make a lot of sense of, but maybe you can. In July 1997, a month after Jaden disappeared, Belinda went to New South Wales for a couple of weeks. She left keys to her home with the police and also with a friend. When she arrived home from the trip, she noticed some of Jaden's clothes that she believed were still in the house were then gone. When she saw the items in the bag, she thought maybe some of those could have been the items taken in July. But Belinda said it wasn't just clothes that were missing, but other things that were found a toy phone, and a pacifier that she had sent with Jaden to Greg's house were now in her house. Belinda had no idea how or why someone would leave those in her house, and I think the only thing I can think of is that after they disposed of Jaden's body, they realized they had these two items left, and they put them in Belinda's house to cover that up, but it would have just been easier to go and throw them in the water, throw them in the dump, do literally anything else. So like I said, this part of the story is, is a little weird to me, but let's get back to that plastic bag. What was really remarkable about it was that there was very little dirt or silt in or on it, almost as though it had not been in the water the whole time. 
and investigators believe they found the reason it was in such good condition, relatively speaking, when they found a children's sleeping bag with a crowbar attached to it, keeping it weighted down in the water. A photograph of the sleeping bag was shown to Belinda, and she said it belonged to her sister, Katie, but Belinda had borrowed it. She knew she had it at Greg's house at one point, but she wasn't sure if she left it there or not. She just didn't remember. The crowbar, however, did not belong to Belinda. She had never seen it before. According to one of Greg's friends, a man named Paul, he had left a similar crowbar at Greg's house in mid-June 1997, along with some other tools. When he asked for the items back later, Greg told them they were at his friend's house, Darren Farr. Now, this isn't the Darren with the pig head. This is the Darren who called Greg on the day Jaden went missing because he thought Greg wanted to kill him. So Paul went to Darren's house to get the tools back, and most of them were there, but the crowbar was not. The investigators believe that Jaden's body and the white bag of items found were put in the sleeping bag and then weighted down with the crowbar. But over the months at the bottom of the lake, the body and the bag eventually floated out of the sleeping bag. That would explain why the plastic bag had so little dirt on it. But how did the sleeping bag with Jaden's body get as far out into the water as it did? A boat was definitely an option. Greg had owned one, but he actually sold it days before Jaden went missing. So now the investigators have to find out, could someone, like Greg, who they've already arrested, could he get the body that far out without a boat? In running a few trials, the police found that the items of that weight couldn't be thrown out that far unless the person walked about waist deep into the water. And it makes sense that someone would do that if they were trying to dispose of a body, get it as far out and as deep as possible. So that brings us back to something we talked about in part one, and that is the wallet and the cash that were found soaking wet. Did Greg forget to take his wallet out of his pocket when he allegedly waited out to dispose of Jaden's body? It definitely seemed like a possibility. Now, Greg said that didn't happen. Everything got wet when he was outside in the rain working on his car. But the police did not think the items would be as wet as they were under those conditions. The items would have had to have been submerged. Obviously, finding Jaden's body and being able to tie the crowbar sort of back to Greg, explaining the wet wallet and how that factored into things, and then all of the witnesses from that night, the Crown felt ready for trial. And this trial was the headline story of the year. A lot of the coverage turned sensational when the details of the cast of characters came out. And I'm saying cast of characters intentionally here because that is 100% how they were treated. This was like a reality TV show or a soap opera playing out in the tabloids, and people were eating it up. We have sisters who had children with the same man, a man who then left for another state. We have a young mom who went out partying. She left her son with a boyfriend she met while she was still with his father. We have a pig's head thrown at someone's house. And the people who did that didn't exactly have squeaky clean records themselves. There was a lot going on in the media, and sometimes we see media portrayal of a case being more dramatic than what happens in the courtroom. And that's 100% what I expected to happen here. I expected I would start looking at the actual court case and it would be incredibly mundane. But there ended up being some drama in the courtroom too. So let's go ahead and get into the trial, just hitting the highlights here. The Crown's theory of the crime is is interesting. So what they say happened was that Greg, an abusive man, had killed Jaden. Details are unknown. Maybe Jaden initially got hurt accidentally, and Greg tried to treat it by wrapping his arm, and then he gave him a pill he thought might help with the pain. But when Jaden wouldn't stop crying, Greg 
lost it. He has a history of having done that when Jaden accidentally got hurt on a car door. Greg lost it and hit Jaden. This time, the crown theorized Greg didn't just hit Jaden, but struck him hard enough to kill him. That's just one theory of how the actual homicide took place. It's what the Crown said happened after that really seems like it was just pulled straight out of a detective thriller novel. They said Greg left his house around midnight with Jaden's body. He brought the body to Belinda's house and put Jaden in his crib. His plan was to bring the intoxicated Belinda home, giving her more to drink in the car so she'd be super drunk, and tell her that Jaden wasn't there, so then she wouldn't go check on him. She would eventually drunkenly fall asleep, and when she woke up in the morning, she would find Jaden dead in his crib, perhaps even thinking she did something to him that she couldn't remember. But at the very least, the police would think she did it. There was a neighbor of Belinda's who said around half past midnight on the night Jaden vanished, she heard a car revving, she looked out her window, and saw a green car parked in front of Belinda's house. Greg did drive a green car. The Crown said that after putting Jaden's body in his crib, Greg went back to his house to wait for Belinda's call to go pick her up. That's when he found his windows smashed and the pig head and realized he had a better cover story delivered to him by the Pighead Brigade. So what Greg did was bring Belinda to his house so that she would see the damage to the house and then bring her back to her home. While there, he went into Jaden's room, took his body out of the cot, which messed up the bedding. Then he drove to Blue Rock Lake, dumped Jaden's body, went home, and changed into dry clothes. Then he went back to wake up Belinda to report Jaden missing. That would mean that when Greg was pulled over for speeding after he dropped Belinda off, Jaden's body would have been in the vehicle under this theory. The defense countered that this theory was missing quite a bit of evidence. Greg's wet clothes, for instance, they were not found or taken. When asked what clothes he wore, Greg pulled them out of a pile of dirty clothes. Supposedly, someone saw wet clothes in his hamper, but they did not take those into evidence. They also didn't fingerprint the inside of Greg's house, which may have shown someone else had entered. Kenny, Yvonne's brother, was asked directly if he thought he could have gotten through the window, even with those glass pieces along the frame jutting out. And he said, yes, he could have. He was an accomplished burglar, apparently. Greg's defense, he had hired a top-notch attorney, by the way, pointed out the other people who should have been more thoroughly investigated. For instance, Greg's friend Darren, who he just had a fight with. Greg said he gave Darren the crowbar. Darren had the rest of the tools, but not that crowbar. And of course, we have Yvonne, her brother, Kenny, and their friend, who's also named Darren. Now, Kenny and Darren did not do the prosecution any favors from the stand. They were angry and aggressive in court. If their goal was to give the impression that they just were not capable of violence, they didn't exactly convey that with their outbursts and hostility toward the attorneys. The Crown did have jailhouse informants, not all who could testify, but the details of what they said Greg said are in the coroner's report if you really do want to read it. Basically, Greg confessed to them, but the details vary a bit, and honestly, incentivized witnesses are not always reliable. I would take them all with a huge grain of salt. But the one I do want to mention is that one of the confessions Greg allegedly gave to an inmate indicated that Jaden's death was accidental, or at least the initial injury was, that the car had fallen off the jack while Jaden was under it. Greg wrote in an unpublished book that that didn't happen, and it couldn't have happened since the car was backed onto ramps and there was no jack except according to the investigators in his early statements to the police, and according to the coronial inquest report, there was a jack, and Greg had even said it wasn't working well. So this is a discrepancy. I think an accidental death and an intentional cover-up does need to be considered as a possibility in this case, 
particularly since someone did try to bandage Jaden's broken arm. If you intended to kill someone, why would you treat their injuries? But that doesn't necessarily mean Greg did it. The defense did present some evidence they believed showed that Jaden didn't die the night he disappeared, but was held for some time. That theory would go along with the initial theory of Belinda and Greg that Yvonne took Jaden to mess with them. But the main piece of evidence they did present for this theory was that Jaden's hair appeared longer than it was when he disappeared. Now, not only is that subjective, we do know that that can be the result of decomposition. As the skin and the soft tissue shrinks, the hair looks longer in comparison, but it's not like it actually grew. I think the bulk of the evidence does point towards Jaden having died the same night he disappeared. So the trial lasted for a few weeks before the jury took the case, and on December 4th, 1998, the jury returned with a verdict of not guilty for both murder and manslaughter. After roughly a year and a half in pretrial detention, Greg Domasavich was a free man. At the time, Victoria had absolute double jeopardy laws, not unlike what we have here in the U.S. and we have discussed in two recent cases. But we will get back to this later because the times are changing in Australia. And I swear it's just a coincidence that double jeopardy keeps coming up in these cases. I am not nearly that coordinated in my scheduling to do this on purpose. So after the acquittal, Belinda was not done trying to get justice for Jaden. There was a closed-door inquest that produced a report that was maybe two pages long. There was nothing in the report that wasn't already public knowledge. And the report actually had one piece of public knowledge completely wrong. They had the wrong birth date for Jaden, the victim. Belinda probably would have been less upset if they did absolutely nothing and didn't even hold the inquest rather than what seemed like a half-hearted job. In Belinda's request for a second inquest, she wrote that if they wouldn't do it for her, at least do it for Jaden, who hadn't even gotten a measure of justice yet. Belinda wanted an inquest that would question witnesses and pursue DNA testing of the evidence. Before Belinda got a final decision that they would hold the second inquest, a preliminary investigation started with the expectation that the inquest would eventually be held, and that included the DNA testing. And boy, was that DNA testing a mess. So female DNA was found on Jaden's bib. Before Greg's trial, they tried to match it. It did not match Belinda, Yvonne, Jaden's sister, cousins, aunt, the neighbor Greg called about diapers, the wives of any of Greg's friends, and so on. They tested everyone they could think of and had no match. Like I said, those tests were run prior to going to trial. So going into trial, this mysterious DNA was known, but it didn't match what the prosecution or the defense were presenting as what happened. So it was a big question mark. Then in 2003, during the coroner's preliminary investigation, they did get a match from the database at the lab where the evidence was processed. The DNA did not match a suspect in another crime, but rather the victim of another crime. It came back as a match to a rape victim we will call Jessica. There were three ways the DNA got on that bib. One was that Jessica was involved, and that was completely ruled out. Jessica didn't know Jaden. She didn't know anyone who knew him. She wasn't in the area. She just flat out didn't do it. So the second way it could have happened is what is called an adventitious DNA match. That is our new forensic vocabulary word of the day. Under this theory, the DNA was not from Jessica, but it was from someone who shared the same loci or loci with her. It's one of the reasons DNA matches are never yes or no. They're a percentage. They're a one in a million, that sort of thing. We can't say for sure that two people won't eventually have the same genes, and the fewer points of comparison, the greater likelihood there will be an overlap. Adventitious matches do happen, but pretty much always when the DNA sample is a partial sample with only around five loci or loci. You can tell I'm tired of getting corrections for my pronunciations. 
Loci or loci, both are acceptable, FYI. Anyway, in this case, there were 10. The odds that Jessica would share 10 with another person was something like 1 in 170 billion. So very unlikely this was an adventitious match. So that leaves us with the third and most likely possibility, which is contamination in the lab. The people in the lab say no way, but the odds say otherwise. Jaden's bib and pants were sent to the lab at the Victoria Police Forensic Services Center on January 30th, 1998, and seven minutes later, Jessica's clothing was in the lab. Now, it's not clear how the contamination happened based on the order the items were processed, the processes within the lab, and the storage of the items. And maybe that's the scary part when we seem to convict or exonerate based on DNA evidence. They couldn't find when Jaden's bib would have been contaminated by the evidence from Jessica's case, but that is by far the most likely explanation. The DNA match was a bust, and it possibly came at the expense of a rape victim having to relive her trauma in the process. So like I said, this retesting of the materials had to do with the upcoming inquest, but it wasn't a guarantee that inquest was even going to happen. It started in November 2003, but Greg immediately tried to stop it. He went to court and managed to have it halted, and then in December 2004, it was ruled the inquest would not move forward, largely based on a technicality. The coroner had cited the wrong section of the Coroner's Act when he started the inquest. So in July 2005, another inquest began, this time citing the correct law. Around 50 witnesses testified, and the report was released in 2006, and it is where we got most of the information covered in this episode. The findings of the inquest were that Jaden's cause of death was the head injury. There was no ruling on whether it was an accident, a matter of neglect of supervision, or intentionally inflicted. But regardless, Greg was the one caring for Jaden at the time, and he failed to do so properly. That contributed to his death, and therefore Greg had contributed to his death. And Greg has actually never denied that his lack of supervision led to Jaden's death. But he said it was the leaving him alone to be kidnapped, and not anything more direct than that. The coroner, though, disagreed. He found that the alternative explanations presented from Greg's camp were unsatisfactory. Not just the alternative suspects, but the idea that Jaden was actually kidnapped and kept alive for some period before his death. The coroner found that he couldn't determine manner of death, but he believed Greg disposed of Jaden's body after. He pointed to Greg's changing stories, the time he was unaccounted for, and the wet wallet and money. The inquest was also pretty critical of the forensic science unit and their handling of the evidence. But while the coroner's inquest did point the finger at Greg, he was still a free man and he could not be charged again under double jeopardy. However, in the 24 years since Jaden's death, double jeopardy laws have changed in Australia. They have changed on a state-by-state basis, with Victoria changing theirs in 2011. Someone acquitted of a crime can be retried in limited circumstances. First, it has to be a serious offense. Murder, manslaughter, aggravated rape, armed robbery, some drug offenses, and arson if it led to death. That's pretty much the range of crimes double jeopardy doesn't necessarily apply to. But the new evidence being brought forward has to be compelling. Not unlike getting a new trial after you've been convicted, This needs to be something big, something like DNA, a person confessing to the crime, or proof that key witnesses had lied due to intimidation or bribery. The application to retry the case would have to go before court, before it's approved. They can't just randomly recharge people. I think you really can look at it as an appeal, but for the Crown side of things, not the defendant's. 
So there is still a question here, though. Will this apply retrospectively? Will this new double jeopardy exception apply to cases where the acquittal occurred prior to the passing of the law? That hasn't been tried in court yet, and I imagine it will be decided through the appellate process should it ever get there. Victoria has yet to try someone a second time for a crime committed before this law was passed. So even if the law as it's written appears to be applied retroactively, we really won't know that until someone tries it in court. In the time since his acquittal, Greg has largely stayed out of the press, except when this case would come up, and he has done two interviews in which he continues to proclaim his innocence. He said the only thing he is guilty of is leaving Jaden home alone. He managed to keep a pretty low profile until earlier this year, 2021, when he had an arrest warrant issued after he missed a court date on some assault charges. The now 52-year-old Greg had been driving a remote control car across a cricket field in late 2019 when he was told to keep the car off the pitch by some of the players. Greg flipped them off, words were said, and Greg left. He went to a nearby house and then came out with what the Crown characterized as a makeshift spear, which is to say a broom handle with a sharpened end. Greg said he grabbed it in case he needed it to defend himself, but when he went to the field with it, the cricketers thought he was the aggressor. They managed to disarm him and knock him to the ground. The police also believed he was the aggressor and he was charged with assault. He missed that court date, which led to an arrest warrant, which led to this being back in the newspapers. In the end, he had to pay a small fine and got a year of probation. As for Belinda, she has since married and had other children while continuing to demand answers as to what really happened to Jaden. While the coroner's inquest found evidence for some of those answers, no one really knows what happened that night except the person who was there when Jaden sustained his injuries. Belinda believes that Greg is that person. In April 2014, the month of what would have been Jaden's 18th birthday, Belinda published a letter to Greg in the media. She wrote about what it's like day in and day out having had a child who died. I literally cannot read you the letter because I will just sob through it. It is heartbreaking. I had tears down my face reading it just preparing for this episode. Belinda ended the letter asking Greg to write down what happened and put it somewhere. Then after he dies, Belinda and the world can learn finally what happened to Jaden. She said nothing will bring Jaden back, but she deserves the truth, and so does Jaden. And if Greg Damasavich is innocent, as he says, that means someone else has that information. While the case is not being actively investigated, the police will follow up on leads, and if you have any of those, you can call the Moe police at 6131281100. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for.